Okay, it's loading, guys. We're almost there. John, do you want to let me know when we're up? It's exciting times. I think it is. It is streaming. It, is, it says it's streaming. Yep. We're good. Nice. Okay, cool. Okay, it's loading, guys. We're Whoa! There. I can John, hear myself. You know Hang on. It's Why can I hear times. myself? I think it is. It is streaming. It, is, it says it's streaming. We're good. Nice. Okay, yeah, I just I think, I, because uh, it was playing on my also. <laughs> okay, right. Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is the CodeWorks thesis presentations. Um, if you haven't seen this before, if you haven't been with us, this is essentially the end of a two-week process for our senior students. Um, they've been working their butts off day and night, creating these incredible apps, um, amazing things. Like it's absolutely astounding what they've managed to do in such a short amount of time. Um, so we just wanted to show everyone their demos and celebrate them, I suppose. Um, so before we get on with that, I just wanted to do a little roll call and show everybody where we are. Um, so Berlin, do we have Berlin here? Make some noise. <laughs> there was a slow grow there, guys. Well done. <laughs> Um, nice. And do we have London? Are you ready? Yeah! <laughs> There's like sounds coming from all around me. It's quite nice. <laughs> um, and Barcelona, are you ready? <laughs> oh my gosh. I hope no one had like really nice headphones in <laughs> for your ears. Um, cool. And do we have remotes? Everybody remote. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, so just to show YouTube maybe how international we are, is there anybody on the remote course who's not in one of the places that I just mentioned? Yeah, I'm, I'm live from Istanbul. So any, anyone Istanbul. who's not in Berlin, not in London, not in Barcelona? I'm in Copenhagen. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Italy. 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 Portugal. No Salvador. Hey. This is awesome. I feel like every time we do this, the list just gets longer and longer. And I know that's not everybody who's in random places. Um, Javi, we love your background. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of people walking behind me, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's beautiful. Um, okay, cool, everybody. So. Um, the way this is going to work is I'm going to share the videos with you, these amazing videos that everybody's put so much effort to make. Um, and then we'll open up to the TAs, so the, their tutor, and they'll say a little something. And then we open up the floor to everybody to ask a question. Uh, so if you're on YouTube, then I guess just type a message in there and uh, John will be your mouth <laughs> for your fingers. Nice. Okay. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, this first group is from Barcelona. Can you see my screen? Nice. Okay. Sorry. Let me just make sure I'm sharing the sound this time. Cool. Okay. Nice. So this group is from Barcelona and they are Emoto. Um, Hi, guys. As you can see, I'm about to be late at CodeWorks, but wait, I just unloaded Emoto. With Imoto, I can see all the available electric scooters in just one map. Once I'm logged in, I have to select a destination. And as I've been into CodeWorks for three months, I have it here in one of my favorites. So I just click and wait for the confirmation map. Perfect, so take me there, please. Once in the map, I can see all the motos with the different colors of each application. And as you can see, Emoto is already offering me the fastest one. So let's click it. Perfect, but wait, I don't have an account with Iberscoot. Hmm, let's filter then. Here I have all of them, so I can just turn off Iberscoot. I save. And again, eMap is recommending me the new moto. Let's click it. Oh, perfect, a Kultra. Let's go. Carlos, one of our juniors, thinks he will have time to go to the gym. So he needs a moto. 
Carlos starts by logging in. And as he has never gone to gym, he needs to input the new destination. He can see that in the map and yeah, let's go. Oh, poor Carlos, he doesn't have motos around. But don't worry, Carlos, because Emoto shows you also which are the incoming motos. So if we click in here, yeah, there is one moto available in one minute because Marcel is going to Codeworks. In the meantime, Carlos decides that as he wants to go to the gym three times per, per week, he wants to save gym as one of its favorites. So let's click in favorites and he just have to put a label. Save. And here we are. And maybe working during the course is pretty difficult, so probably Carlos doesn't need it. He can delete and go back to the map. Perfect, so in just one minute he will have his moto available. As Imoto predicted, here is Marcel arriving on time. To bring this awesome application to life, we decided to use React because it's our favorite framework. As a challenge, we wanted a state management tool, so we use Redux because it works very well with React. Um, also, TypeScript uh, with both React and, and Redux provides a safe environment to work on and it brings a first layer of testing for all code. And we also wanted to align our backend with the front end of our application, so we decided to use Less.js as it allows you to use TypeScript on the server side. And Less.js also allowed us to learn a new way of structuring the server side of our application. We would like to point out a few things. First of all, make sure that you spend enough amount of time on planning and designing how the front end will look like and how it will be connected to your backend. You can use some wireframing tools like Figma that help all team members to have clear view of how the front end design will look like and how the data in your application will flow. Also, it's important to stress out the fact that you can try new technologies and it's very cool. Just make sure that you're aware of the trade-off between new technologies and development time because it's going to be probably slower, right? And finally, just have a lot of fun because it's awesome to have a, a new project with a new idea and bringing it to reality. <laughs> Sorry, that stopped pretty suddenly there. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> Um, really nice job, guys. Uh, I don't know what's going on with Barcelona. Always, always like advertisements, the videos. <laughs> um, also, I feel like there was a little dig at Carlos there um, with the gym. <laughs> um, anyways, moving on. Leo, do you have anything to say? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that the project was ended up by being very, very nice. Actually, the idea is, is very cool. I have a friend that he has like probably five different types of, of uh, like the services. He's always wasting a lot of time looking for the best one. And in the meantime that he's looking for the best, the one that he chooses is going to go away. So I think he's going to really appreciate if these guys are going to actually publish this. So we moved in the cabinet so we can ask really ask question for this guy. And my question is, as the juniors are now tackling um, ang Angular, and they're very happy with like doing that. Uh, <laughs> why don't you tell us a little bit more about Nest.js, which is basically uh, Angular but for the for the backend? So I'll let them the stage. Hi. Uh, well, actually, Nest is kind of Angular for the backend, and we didn't know that until we found that. But it's actually um, an amazing. It's an amazing framework because it's very opinionated, but it's very well structured. So once you learn how it works and how to structure the files, it's actually like very easy because you just have to follow the path that the, the proper framework is, is it's telling you to follow. So yeah, it's cool. Nice. Um, I don't know if uh, the juniors will agree with you that Angular is nice or TypeScript is nice. <laughs> Not yet, anyway, they will. They will tomorrow. 
Um, I think we'll have to try and, and we'll see. <laughs> yeah. um, Suyang, you have a question? Hey guys, that was awesome. I was just wondering, where did you uh, get your data from for all of the uh, scooters and like the incoming? Like what, is that an API that you're connected to or several? Just wanted to know, it was awesome, thanks. Uh, fortunately, we found an API that actually gives you real-time data on the different apps, at least in Barcelona. So Fluctuo. for now, yeah, it's called Fluctuo. And playing with that and Mapbox that has some APIs for geolocation and directions, yeah, we could do combine both. Nice. Um, Alessandro? Sure. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I actually had the same question, uh, which is uh, what uh, what APIs were available for the data, which uh, just got answered. But I, I'm going to twist the question to another one because I think the app is brilliant. And one of the things that um, um, a sim similar thing applies with to electric scooters, the uh, you know the, the small ones. Uh, and for example, in some cities, there is like ten different um, brands, ten different providers, and all have their own separate app. And it's a total pain because you got to have like 20 different apps on your phone uh, and you never you know which one to use, blah, blah, blah. So the question is, um, do you, are you thinking of launching something like this? And if so, what is the timeline you have in mind and what locations? Mm, so basically, we got very excited when we realized that Fluke 2 offers not only the scooters, but also other means of transport. And yeah, definitely we would like to make go put it live and make it available. Uh, we want to make sure that first we, we like we'll get done with all the job that we have done here, and then we will work on that uh, in the future. Uh, first, starting with Barcelona, as the data is really accurate. And yeah, we'll see in the future how it goes. Nice. That's actually what we said with uh, my my thesis group. We were like, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll open it in all different cities, and we'll have to go to the cities to you know test it out. <laughs> Business trips, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, Baiju, you have a question. Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Like, um, I really wanted to know. Like, this is a beautiful app. First of all, congratulations. Uh, wanted to know how did you manage between the planning part and the execution part? Uh, this looks very polished and I'm assuming that a lot of planning would have gone into it. So how did you uh, make that uh, time allocation and how did you come up with this perfect app? Well, actually we invested a lot of time uh, like designing, we use Figma for this, for the, the front end. But I think we invested like two or even three days just in planning and deciding how the component will look like and how the, the data will flow. So also we meet like two or three times a day. Uh, I think that what worked for us at the, at the end uh, a lot of communication, a lot of communication and planning at the beginning. And also, if you want to say something. Yeah, and also being very open about the upcoming issues. If you struggle with something, just do not keep it silent. Uh, raise it uh, straight away to the team because most likely there's someone who can help you with that. So open communication and planning ahead a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's great advice. Like being friends with your group is lovely, I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping friends after two weeks also. <laughs> and then ending the friendship <laughs> um, okay. awesome work guys congratulations again thanks uh, sorry <laughs> keep interrupting um, sorry John I think you have a question or is it from YouTube uh, it's from YouTube uh, I just want to say before, before I ask the question great job guys really beautiful app another vote for please release it in Barcelona um, Alex, who's tuned into the YouTube channel, would like to know, uh, are there any drawbacks using Nest with React rather than Angular? We just felt more comfortable in the front end with React. So yeah, it was that trade of that, that I said in the presentation that it's about what you want to do and what you feel more comfortable, what is going to slow down the development time. So yeah, we just found this that it's a good balance because it's also TypeScript both in front end and, and back end. 
So yeah, it helped us a lot about uh, how to structure the app in the end. Yeah, and I also think that as since we decided to use Redux and we were aware that it will take some time to actually manage to do stuff that we want, uh, that we need, we knew that we will have to invest some part of time in Redux, and we were. Uh, with TypeScript, especially because a lot of boilerplating with with TypeScript and Redux, and we were really familiar with React before, so we didn't want to put Angular into that to make our development speed even slower. <laughs> I I think um I think also maybe they wanted to know is there anything that was difficult with um, Nest and React rather than if you were to do it with Angular, some on top of the the drawbacks. So in the end, we, you just define endpoints for the front end to reach, and they are like two separate entities. So I, I really, I, I think it went smooth. So for us, the, the, the back end was just some entity that prepared the endpoints for us, and we were just hitting them. So I think if we would work with Angular and with React, that would be pretty much the same in terms of communication between front end and back end. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, well, another round of applause, I think. <laughs> um, also, I forgot to say, unmute yourself when you're applauding, because it's really weird if I'm just clapping by myself. <laughs> okay, um, so we're going to move on. The next group is called Bloodworks, and they're a group from our Eastern Standard Time cohort. Uh, so yeah, all the way from the Americas. Hey, okay. Stop it. It's oh. starting right now. Um, I think someone's un not muted. <laughs> Oh, sorry. That was me. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Can you see my screen? Nice. We are Yulia, Maxine, Ari, Joseph, and Jay, and we are presenting to you Bloodworks. Bloodworks is a tool that takes patients' data and uses data visualization to present the data in a more visual and understandable way. So, why Bloodworks? Because even though data is great, data by itself can be very confusing. So we're transforming data into something that's more visual, making it easier to understand. There are several studies that show that visual aids improve patient understanding and judgment. So we decided to use data visualization to show patient data over time. As a health provider, I can log in using an account that I've already created. That will take me to a dashboard with my recent patients. Say I wanted to add some medication and a diagnosis for Arwen. I just click on diagnosis and I'm going to add something medication, Prozac, and I will submit it. Then if I want to see an overview of Arwen's health, which will include the blood work I've done, there is a graphical representation of the blood work that has been submitted by me previously. So we can see blood pressure and glucose and LDL. And then at the bottom, uh, we have the diagnosis and the medication that I gave. Now, if we hover over one of these circ circles, we can see the measurement that was taken at that specific date. If we wanted to see an overview of one of the visits, then we just click on one of these past visits. And this takes us to a graphical representation of the entirety of one of these lab works that was done on December 8th day. So you can see that the ranges are defined by this sort of darker blue color right here. That's the normal range. And the marker right here is the measurement that was taken for Arwen on that day. If we scroll down, we can also see the diagnosis and the medication that was given. Okay, and so for the tech stack, what have we used for the tech stack? We used, on the front end, we used React with Redux for state management. We also used Next.js, and we also used the library D3 for data visualization. On the back end, we used Postgres with Typeform as the ORM, 
and for our server we did use Express. And for the entire app we also use TypeScript and also Docker so we can join all the three of our apps. Some of the problems we encountered during the making of this app were that we did encounter a few bugs within Next.js, uh, gathering our thoughts on what our final product should look like and delegating some specific tasks. Our wireframe could have been more thought out in the beginning uh, to solve those questions regarding styles. But overall, we worked great as a team, and if we had more time, we would like to continue our CSS styling. <laughs> really good. Sorry, I think someone was just saying something. Um, really good job, guys. Um, I always like seeing the mock users that people use for their apps. It like gives a little bit of insight into people. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Um, cool. Okay, Igor, do you have anything to say? Yeah, sure. Uh, great job, guys. I'm really proud of. Uh, your of your project uh, i think you should be proud as well like i re, uh, i've done the code review on on github just yesterday and uh, like when i was looking at it i really really wished like i could send it back to you like 11 11 weeks ago right and what's your what's your reaction because the code is really solid like i i couldn't believe my eyes what what i'm seeing it's really really impressive job guys um also i really like that you walked into um, a lot of unknowns like a custom d3 you decided not to use uh pre-made some libraries but you decided to like create these graphs uh in custom manual way next yes type ORM, like uh the, the this thing that you decided you actually created three different apps and then stitch them together with uh, in one container with the uh, nginx or your proxy like a uh, just just impressive impressive job guys and um, my question would be I, I couldn't notice that you've uh, you've opened private repos so like uh, normally and uh, normally the uh we would we would do that if we we have some commercial incentives and so are we seeing new startup in the making here um yeah we we're not sure who is going to talk so i'll just say it. um we're thinking of like continuing after because we all still really like um, the project idea and we still have a lot of features that we didn't get to implement and that we want to implement. So we thought that we could continue to try to maybe sell it um, or market it, but if not, then we could just continue on it and make it stronger for our portfolio and learn more and work together as a team. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And uh, regarding one feedback regarding the presentations, I really would like to see a bit more energy and you could you could start with the hi my name is Max from EST team and then proceed something like that and the end says thank you that was team from EST but yeah we will talk about later about this this kind of issues but uh, other than that great job guys great job <laughs> I can just imagine though, after like 12 hours a day, it's like, yes, this is our app. <laughs> but no, this was good. It was a good video, guys. Um, okay, I think there's a question from YouTube or is it you, John? <laughs> no, it's always YouTube. Uh, okay. we've, got a, we've got a question from Lucas who's tuned into the YouTube stream. He wants to know whether, uh, due to the sensitivity of the data you're dealing with, whether there are any kind of special security considerations or anything like that, or maybe anything you'd like to put in in the future uh, to make sure that all of that data is well looked after. Okay, yes. So for the authentication, we have full encrypted data for the provider. Um, we still have not included encrypted data for the patients yet, but we do plan to do that in the future. Nice, cool. Um, 
I also have one question, actually. So um, you guys are all remote and you're working in different places. And I know that Docker was only introduced, like it was taught maybe halfway through the project. So maybe like just before the MVP, MVP I think, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so I don't know, when I was doing it, I thought Docker was like this massive thing, which I was like, whoa, it's too much to learn in the middle of a project. So how was your experience with that? Was it, was it good? Yeah, um, um, Igor actually during the lecture he helped us to set up Docker in our in our app, so it was much easier. We have to thank Igor a lot for that because he really helped us in that part. Um, sometimes it was not easy because everyone was working on a different app because we had three apps: we had the landing page, we had the actual app, and we had the server. So it was not that easy to deal with Docker because everyone is just dealing with their local ones and then we had to join everything together. But I think it's really useful because especially the way we use our app, like our landing page will send a token to our local storage and will redirect you to the other app, to the app page. So without Docker, I'm not sure how we would be able to do that. So it was really helpful in the end. Nice, awesome. Um, guys, should we have one more round of applause? This time, unmute your mics. <laughs> Ooh. I have I have a quick quick question for Maxine. Sorry for for being late on that. But super super quick. Uh, Maxine, are you planning on writing a blog post on this? <laughs> on the application that we yeah, made. Yeah, the apps that you're releasing. Yeah, probably. Well, yeah, we'll see. I'm obviously like seven weeks behind. I have stuff written, but just like no time to copy, edit, right. and post them. If you, if you guys, if you guys end up uh, making it public or publishing something, it'd be lovely to have also a blog post that comes with it. Yeah, we'll do. Thanks. We've just like gained you more people on YouTube. <laughs> okay, um, cool. So let's move on to the next one. And these guys are from our CET remote group. And this is Bid Local. <laughs> I just, Peter, you were muted, but it looked like you were just having fun. <laughs> Hi. Whenever we come across any attractive and useful things, we think we think of having it, but sometimes price puts us off. We have developed an app where a consumer can decide what the price should be, and our app is called BitLocal. It's a mix of Gumtree and eBay. In the app, you can sign up and you can sell your item. At the same time, consumer can bid on other others' item. The bidding process is real time, so the uh, the person who bids at the last get, gets the item. Now uh, Matt will show you how the app works. Thanks Madhu. So we'll start by logging into the app, but before we do that, we've got to register. So I'll create my details here, brand new email and password. Let's type that in. And as soon as I've done that, BidLocal is going to recognize me and I'll be able to go in and uh, place my item up for sale. Okay. So here we are back to the signing screen, into the details, and we should be into the app. There we are, loading, and we're in. Right, let's go list my item. So I've got a guitar in my flat that's just filling up space, so let's see who wants it. So I fill in the title of the guitar, of the product. Uh, the price I'm going to prepare to sell it for, uh, description used by Elvis, of course. I then put a typo, I'll pick category and some images. So here's one of the images I'm going to pick. Up it goes. And we're going to add the item for sale. Let the bidding commence. On to you, Peter. Here we're going to show you what a bidding war looks like between all five of us. So as you can see, we're all entering bids into the make offer. As we enter the bids, all pages are updated live with this score. So we can all see the current highest score. As the time ticks down, we see that live as well. And when the time uh, passes, nobody will be able to place any more bids. And the current highest bid at that point will be the winner. As you can see, Alejandro here makes a huge bid of 3,000 euros because he's made of money. And as the time ticks down, 
nobody is able to outbid that. And that's the end of the bidding. So now Alejandro will go out of this and to his winner's screen. Where he'll be able to see the item listed that he's won with contact details so he can contact the seller. That is it for our demonstration. For the tech stack, on the front end, we use the React Native with Native Base to have some pre-built components. Well, on the server, we used Express with uh, Apollo and GraphQL so that we could manage all the different requests from the client and send back only the required data. We also used JSON Web Tokens for the authentication and the Cloudinary API so we could store the images uploaded by the users. Finally, for the database, we used MySQL with SQLize and Docker to make sure that everyone was working on the same database and wasn't having any compatibility issues. So what we learned uh, during these two weeks was that, uh, first of all, <laughs> choose your tech stack carefully. Uh, firstly, if you're having problems in the pre-course, you definitely need to sort that out even by changing operating system or computer, because during projects that becomes definitely a much, much bigger problem. Um, also, I think teams need to have a flexibility of mind of changing uh, technologies at the beginning of the project if, if some things cause a lot of problems. Um, and also, if you're doing a React Native app, I would consider like separating the back end from the front end in terms of Git repositories. Uh, when it comes to planning, um, I think that it's really important to be patient and dig out details uh, in terms of logic, um, going through all the steps that an algorithm needs to make, and visually in terms of making wireframes. The more you spend time doing that, the, the smoother everything is going to work out for teams. Um, you should really try to assume as little as possible uh, because when things are on paper you can discuss them and everyone can be clear about them uh, and when they're not uh, it, it could really you could really have very different ideas to each other um, if you follow the information flow that helps a lot in in working out what you need um, and finally uh, meet a lot uh, and meet, meet often ask a lot of questions uh, if anything's not clear um, and having like a, a main development and features branch really helps to avoid conflict. Um, really good job, guys. I love the way that you had the multiple screens up for the bid war. Um, it made it super exciting. I was like, wow, who's going to win? Um, <laughs> awesome. So is it Bernie? I think, Bernie, do you have anything to say? Yeah, so um, I want to say, first of all, congratulations, guys, because it looks amazing. I've, I've been seeing all the steps that you took in the project from um, we hardly know what to do to decide that we're going to be doing a bidding place and then finally get it, getting it synchronized and having all the bits happen simultaneously and working all together. Uh, it's been amazing. Um, congrats on choosing, uh, the, from the very beginning, dockerizing the database. I think that solved a lot of problems uh, for you. And it also helped you on the last step, step of the process, which is like just deploying the back end and having everything synchronized at once. Uh, that was really good. So can you tell us a little bit about um, the technologies that you were using and how, for example, uh, GraphQL has helped you with a Polo client, a Polo server, and synchronizing all of that? Has it brought you any advantages rather than using a regular REST API? Um, I, I think like it, it um, I mean, it was good for the front end because, I mean, we had like a few uh, endpoints and then they could grab the information they needed for the various screens. Um, so in that sense, it was quite useful for them. Nice. Uh, Su Young, do you have any, do you have a question? Yeah, this is from us here in London. 
I think when we saw the live bidding, we were definitely expecting to see socket IO. Uh, so we're curious about how real time was managed to uh, negotiate such quick communication between so many different people. Yeah, so for that, uh, we have uh, there, there is functionality in, um, in GraphQL. It's, a, it's called subscription. It works with the uh, WebSocket. So we use that. I, um, before starting, we didn't know that we, we, we were planned to use um, socket IO, but then we, we discovered that the, uh, GraphQL gives us the facility to use the subscription, which works with a web socket. That was thanks. Good. Thanks, Oscar. <laughs> nice, awesome. Um, we also have a question from YouTube. John? We do. We do. Uh, Zara, who's watching the YouTube uh, stream, would like to know kind of the flip side of the previous question, which is uh, what issues did you encounter when you were trying to implement the, the real-time data feature? I think everybody's pretty obsessed with that real-time bidding part. Yeah, so it's uh, the subscription is really nice. It updates all the data you have on your page from other GraphQL queries immediately, which is it just works really smoothly. The problems we had came a bit more from, um, we had a Boolean, which was testing whether you were the current highest bidder or not and displaying that on the page. Getting that to work seamlessly was a lot harder because we were making tests with that data. So if you're just displaying the raw data, it's fine. If you're then trying to manipulate the data to make something else, then it becomes a lot more tricky. Nice. Um, are there any other questions? Anything else? I feel like with these kind of things, um, especially for the juniors or anyone who's a bit more new to programming, you look at it and you're like, yeah, this is a cool app, but then you don't realize the intricacies that go into things that you don't even think about, like this live bidding war. Like <laughs> it's not as not as easy as it looks. <laughs> um, so really well done, guys. That's awesome. It's super complicated and you should be really chuffed. Um, okay, so if we don't have any more questions, let's move on to the next group. And that is on Gaku from Barcelona. Nice. So. I love music, and I love buying records, and I love sharing these records with my friends. I buy and sell these records via Discogs, an online music database and marketplace where you can find many undiscovered gems. However, the problem with Discogs is the sparsity of the community across many other platforms. Introducing Ongaku, the online music sharing community with an intuitive way to connect with others about what matters for us, the music. You can think of Ongaku as a music sharing platform inspired by Slack. Discover, explore and discuss music from more than 25 million records on the Discogs database, most of which you didn't even know existed. Ongaku translates as the joy of sound, and that's what we aim to provide and share with our community of music lovers. The landing page gives you a brief overview of our company ethos. Now, let's log in. You authenticate through Discogs, and the good thing is, you will only have to do this once because we remember you. On your first time, you're presented with some options to let us know what music you're into. I'm going for electronic, experimental, and jazz. Let's check out that electronic page. This post makes me think of another great record that these guys would appreciate too. I could search through the entire Discogs database to find it, but I already have it saved in my want list. I don't think that they will be able to stop listening to this one. Ha, cool, now everyone can see it. I want to start a new channel, but just for me and my friends. We are really into ambient 90s at the moment.
All that is left to do now is invite my friends. I want to join the private channel my friend started earlier. Alien FM, cool. I'll come back to this later. Let's go check out this post I'd saved before. I need to get more details about this record. All the information I could want is right here on the detail page. I can even add it to my Discord one list. Now, let's get more info about the label. I can easily see their other release as well and explore even further. And the cool thing is, I can even listen to the song right here in the app. We chose our tech stack for fast development, performance, scalability, and availability of support. React offers huge amounts of flexibility and Redux gives scalable state management. We combine this with TypeScript to offer a level of robustness that JavaScript sometimes lacks. For a majority of the styling, we use SAS, add in Chakra for the side nav, and GSAP for some of the animations. For authentication, we used OAuth 1.0 and Passport as a wrapper. We opted to do this because it was the main option that Discogs offered. It ended up being quite difficult, as a lot of popular companies have built-in strategies, but we had to build our own from the ground up. It's hard to keep a uniform design pattern and make sure that everyone's on the same page when you don't have a specified UX designer. This can cause problems, but make sure to discuss these openly and come to a solution together. You've probably heard this one before, but get good at Git. Version control is your most important tool when working as a team. If we were to start again today, we would spend more time setting up an initial structure. This includes having a good and uniform mock data and a global state architecture to follow. Take some time to set up your environment. It's not as easy as it sounds, especially when working in a group. Thanks for watching from the team at Ongaku. Um, what is it with Barcelona and these advertisements? <laughs> Honestly, I feel like that was not just an ad for um, Ongaku, but also the Barcelona campus. <laughs> it looks so I was cool. going to ask the same question. Like, what? All the all the Barcelona videos have this like very curated editing and stuff. So, like, what is what is the thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's Leo. They've got an extra sprint, which is just on like '80s advertisements. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Leo. There's any investor in the in the chat? Like the the Ongaku startup is already getting the first round of investment around five million. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually have no like I don't know what to say. I'm very very impressed. The the app is so big and very well done, and it works so smooth. Obviously, there were some bugs. I I, I saw it, <laughs> but that was like amazing. Like the video was actually feeling very very professional, and the entire app felt so complete you had like this idea and like you brought it like all, all the way to the end and I think actually you should try to keep working on it and try to see if actually there's also market because I think actually Berlin people is gonna definitely <laughs> download the app <laughs> and use it a lot so my question is you're a very like big group because it's five of you and the the also the tech stack is very big so what was the most challenging part both on the technical side so like um, let's say in terms of code and also in planning and managing like a such a big team hi guys um so i think the main challenge that we had was um just making sure that we all had the same idea because at in the initial kind of few days we were whiteboarding figuring out what we wanted to achieve and it turned out that we actually were talking about five different ideas and um, so just having that initial stage of getting it all down writing everything out and making sure that we were on the same page was really important um in terms of the technical side i will let elijah take over <laughs> um so in terms of the technical stuff the main problem we encountered was kind of task management i would say so <clears throat> at the beginning, we all had certain stuff that we were working on and that was fine, that was great. 
but towards the end when there was only one or two things left to work on that was kind of very difficult to split amongst five people and it ended up being a lot of people kind of sitting around watching other people do their work and it was very <laughs> frustrating for everyone so I think just in general better management of who's going to do what and when they're going to do it would really help in the long run. Nice. Um, I feel like if you're sitting around watching other people do things, maybe uh, you like have more things that you could do. You could only... <laughs> that's not a, that's I don't think that's a terrible problem to have when you've only had two weeks to do this incredible thing. <laughs> um, Igor, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, as someone who worked 20 years in the music industry, I have uh, I have maybe a weird question. Why discogs? Um so I reason, So it was kind of like the reason that I have this problem, I've been using Discogs for over 10 years and uh, I feel like the way that we kind of, um, I communicate with my friends is that we mainly just share music either via WhatsApp or Facebook groups. And there was never like something that was connected directly to Discogs. And the community on Discogs was like, it wasn't very intuitive to me. So this provides a solution that allows us to um, communicate, provide channels, um, access your collection, your want list, and also to be able to meet other like-minded people. So it was more of a community. It's also one of the like, biggest music databases on the internet. Like we mentioned it in the video. I think it's got 25 million records uh, available through their API. And it's allowed us to do some cool stuff with the like details page where you could go from one artist and you can see every label that they're involved with and you can check out every label and from there you can see every track and then for every track you can see every artist or that and so on and so on so it's kind of like a really good way to discover new music as well nice what's what's the api once again uh discogs nice. api cool can you can you can you post uh, the link in the in the chat because i think that other students in the future might might love to use it for other projects yeah, sure, sure. yeah. Um, I've never even heard of Discogs. I didn't realize there was such a massive database out there. I would have thought like, oh, Spotify or maybe iTunes. <laughs> awesome. I also have a question on that note. That logo is so cool. And the animation with the logo, was it, did you guys make it? Well, like, how did you do that? So I made the logo, but all the honors for the animations come to Elijah. He's pretty really good at it, especially for the little bubbles. <laughs> so um, like Charles made the logo. It's really cool. It's all SVG lines and SVG is amazing to animate. And the guys who use D3 can probably attest to how flexible SVGs are. But whenever you've got an SVG path or a set of SG path, SVG paths, you can really animate it from start to finish. It allows for some really cool effects. Nice. Um, cool. Are there any more questions from any? Oh, Igor? <laughs> yeah, I have a I have follow up question. OK, but do you think it's possible to to, to make uh, to refactor your app to, to be used with Spotify API, for instance? Uh, I don't see why not, but a lot of the Discogs records like it's so extensive, it goes back a lot further for music that's even on Spotify. So I think there's literally no reason to, everything that's on Spotify would be on Discogs, but there's also more that's not even on Spotify. Well, I, I can give you at least one reason. I'm, I'm Googling now the number of users for the Discogs is half a million and for uh, Spotify is uh, 150 million in 300 times more. I think we would maybe plan to add authentication through other ways other than Discogs, but to still use the Dis Discogs API for the main source of data. Great job, guys. Thanks. Nice. James, I can see you shaking your head there, James Hugh. <laughs> I've spotted you. Do you have an input on this? Uh, I guess it's more just the, the music on Discogs and the people that use Discogs. Uh, tend to be people that collect records and spend a lot of money on buying records and supporting the artists. And I just, uh, I know that Spotify is getting a lot of stick lately for not supporting the artists as much as they should. Um, so for that reason, I buy records and uh, I use Discogs as a place to buy used records. So that's why I was shaking my head. <laughs> I think you should message Retam and have a chat about it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. This is awesome. I feel like this is educational. <laughs> Sorry, Mandy, carry on. 
then maybe he can join one of the private channels with Rita and they can have the discussion going on the app. Yes, please. <laughs> is, oh, no, no. is it deployed? Are you guys deploying it? Uh, it's not deployed at the moment. We've got big plans, so we'll <laughs> watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe here. <laughs> nice. Okay, guys, um, let's do one more round of applause before we move on. All right, our next group is from London and it's Chit Chat. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm Brett. I'm Mohammed. And, and this is Chit Chat. Chit Chat is a web platform where foreign classrooms connect in real time for language and cultural exchange with peers, all under the safety of supervision by their teachers. Chit Chat supplements and improves traditional classroom-based methods of language education. A few weeks before beginning, Matt was approached by friends, a pair of Spanish teachers, looking for developers to work on their idea. They liked the idea of a pro bono team creating a prototype of their vision, and we liked having clients to provide direction for the project, along with wireframes and design patterns. We're all really happy with what's emerged. Our prototype allows for live chat in small groups with both text and short form audio messaging. Teachers can assign tasks to students who then submit their work by uploading a prepared file. Students can comment on each other's submitted work to give feedback and teachers can censor student interaction to keep the environment constructive and fun. Let's start off logging in as a student. Matt here is a student in a Spanish class. Immediately after logging in, he's shown recent assignments submitted by his teammates from his own school's class, as well as in the paired course. In this case, a class from Spain. Let's check out what Ava submitted for her English homework. Here we see a preview of what Ava's turned in. Matt can download it to see how her English is coming along and add a like or write a comment to let her know what he thinks. This is a chat room, which pairs three students from each course to interact with one another and talk about whatever tasks their teachers have assigned them. Teacher Vic is reminding Matt to submit the assignment from last week. We're on it. Let's quickly upload what Matt prepared for homework and get right back to the chat. No sabía que podemos grabar audio. Eso es fantástico. No sabía que podemos grabar audio. Eso es fantástico. Now, logging in as our teacher Vic, we see a similar page of recent student activity, but with a few more features. Teachers could have many different classes so they can choose which one they're seeing with this drop down. Teachers can even opt to have students use the app directly in the target language, but let's continue in English for now. Looks like Matt has submitted his work. Let's see. We can download this to look over, but in the meantime, we see a not so nice comment from another student, naughty Andre. We'll just delete it and Vic will have a talk with him later. Vic was waiting on Matt and Ollie, so now it's just Ollie left to submit his work. Let's check to see if he's done it. Yep, there's still no file from Ollie uploaded. We can pop into his team's chat and remind him. Okay, now that Vic is pretty caught up on last week's assignment, let's give out this week's. We can navigate to the task page to see what to assign. Each student in the class will now have this new task on their assignments page and we can get to work after the chat today. Chip Chat was built using React with TypeScript alongside SAS styling and Redux for state management. Our backend used a Node.js Express server routing to a Postgres database hosted in the cloud with AWS and accessed with SQLized ORM. Other libraries used include Socket.io, JWT, and Malta. We organize our code with Git Actions and our development process with Prella. Limiting the MVP was very challenging for us. 
We have a client with a great idea and we could work for another three months before approaching the goals they see for the app. We knew on the other hand that we had to polish some smaller version to show for today and so we were forced to be somewhat rigid in what we would or would not include in this prototype. We were also challenged by combining technologies that do not necessarily play well together. Socket.io and Redux, for example, both act as sources of truth for an application and so can fight with each other for precedence when not explicitly and precisely told how to interact. We chose to use SQLize to interact with our database directly, primarily to gain experience working with the library. Looking back, however, GraphQL would work very nicely with our tables and absolutely would be something to consider for future iterations. We could have also simplified splitting off to work independently if we had used a container framework like Docker, rather than all working directly on the same database. By the time we had the opportunity to do so, however, we had already overcome most of the associated hurdles and instead focused on polishing the MVP. Thanks for watching, and we hope you enjoyed hearing about Chit Chat. Really good job, guys. Um, it's so nice when you get everyone involved in the uh, in the app itself. I, th I think a lot of people saw their names there. Um, also want to just say, I really like how you guys strung your tech stack together in a sentence. Um, that's not easy to do. <laughs> so well done, Mo. Like, it, that was a mouthful. Like, that she should be proud. Um, Andre, do you have anything to say? Yes, first of all, guys, what an amazing job. I cannot believe the amount of features that you managed to cram in the app while making it so clean and organized. It's just the one thing about this group is everything they did was so well planned, so well thought out that I kind of wish they, they wrote instructions for the next students so that they could you know, achieve the same level of just quality. So guys, congratulations. And I wanted to ask, Apart from GraphQL, is there anything else you would do differently if you would do the, the app again today? What do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> GraphQL was the main one that we kind of knew would probably fit, but I think we had all worked with it in the previous two projects. Uh, and so we were wanting to uh, work with SQLize, knowing that that's what's still in a lot of legacy code in different companies. Uh, and that there's always opportunity to refactor for even more practice with GraphQL. But um, no, I think we were really happy with uh, what we had planned out. Yeah, I mean, uh, the only thing I would add is, is Docker, right? Like, yeah, Docker. <laughs> we, we did the lecture on Docker after we kind of got over the pain of, of using one database that we were posting online. Um, so I think we definitely would have used that earlier. But once, once, once we had the lecture, we were kind of past, past the pain. Um, on that note, so I, I think you said that the main pain was like sharing the database. Did you consider doing like a migration or set up some seeding or was that not something that you thought about? That was also on the table. I think we uh, just had other stuff that we needed to do first. And then by the time it was like, oh yeah, time we could do migration and seeding files and oh, or we could, you know, polish the Redux and get our app functional. <laughs> so it was a nice to have and we didn't get there. <laughs> I think that's the thing when you've got like two weeks to create something, but it's obviously paid off. And now you can appreciate um, Docker even more than anyone else, I suppose. <laughs> um, John, do you have a question from YouTube? Uh, I do. This one's from Zara again. She said there's a lot of relational data in that app. So she was wondering how long you spent on the database design. <laughs> yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> um, it, it was the first thing that we, we started with the data because we knew that it would all be very relational and fit well together in terms of the relationships between them. It was clearly many to many in some cases, many to one, and putting that in a clear format where we would always be able to reference and be on the same page no matter what was really important. And I think really key to us being able to split off and work on different things is that we were agreed on how our data looked. So that was kind of step one for us. And we didn't start coding until most of the way through the second day. Nice. Um, John, I think you have another question. 
I do. This one's actually for me. Um, I, uh, <laughs> you talked in the video about how you, like you had all these features that you wanted to have, but you had to kind of strip them back uh, to make sure that you could get things finished in time. What process did you use to do that? Were you using like story points or something like that? How did you decide which features made the cut and which you had to, would need to wait for later? Yeah, so we agreed quite, um, right at the start, we, we just agreed a very uh, kind of, this is what MVP looks like. So very early on, we knew what we were trying to create. The, the, all the additional features and things came from our clients and we just had to um, manage their expectations every two weeks and say, that's, that's awesome. That goes in the nice to have bucket, um, which we then just put in a drawer and shut and nobody <laughs> But we, we, there's, there's plenty more we could do to meet that, like, to create either their fully functioning app. We were grateful to have really like inspired clients with a broad vision, but we had two weeks, so <laughs> pick and choose. Cool. Um, Vic, you also have a question. Yeah, one, one question. Have you had a chance to show it to the clients yet? Uh... Yeah, so we did show them this afternoon um, and the feedback was quite positive. Um, they were quite impressed with what we managed to achieve in two weeks, which was uh, nice. Yeah, they seem quite surprised by how much we could get, get done in the two weeks. Yeah, you did get a lot done. Um, and the, the audio, like having audio in your chat, I feel like people don't realize that can be a bit fiddly as well. There was um, a moment, Brett, wasn't there? Oh, there were, there were a few moments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now when I clicked, it was a big celebration. The whole building felt it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone was partying. Everyone knew that they'd fix the audio. It was great. <laughs> Vic, don't, don't dog them out with the set timeout. <laughs> that is valid code. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, is there any other questions for this group? No? Let's have one more round of applause then. Okay. So this next group is from our Berlin cohort, and this is Covent. Hello everyone, this is Benjamin and Lucas and we would like to show you the website we created. It's called Covent and it's uh, connecting uh, people through events. Um, basically, um, it's like a, a Tinder uh, type of app, but um, there is an exception, which is that uh, the user have a description and you can match not only based on the picture, but also based on the description. So for example, if someone is uh, planning to go to a bar and to watch the game and then maybe go to a club just like a specific description and if you're also interested in doing that you can just click on interested and you can then uh, have a chance to match with that person and meet that person so i'll just walk you through the website first i will log in with uh, an account called alex um, and if you go to the profile you see that alex um, has already got some matches he has invited people by clicking on interested, as I showed you. And um, a lot of uh, people also invited him. It's like already like um, five people in total, but these ones he still has to uh, validate the request. So it's like, um, well, it's basically Joachim, but he's named Benjamin for some reason. And uh, here you have Robert. And um, so if he wants to match with Robert, for example, because he's interested in, in, in the event Robert posted, he can just uh, press the button and Robert will appear in the matches. And then, of course, he will contact the matches by going to the chat room. And he, here are the, all the, the chats that are available, so all the matches. And if he wants to interact with Benjamin, for example, he will say... Right, yeah, it was already there, but now you see it's working. Um, and now if I log out and go back to Benjamin's account, so you go to Benjamin's profile, he's got even more matches, but hasn't received invitations recently. Go to the chat and you receive the messages. There you go. 
All right, so that's basically it. Uh, we are still implementing um, some um, features. For example, uh, the fact that you can swipe by categories to match with people who share the common interests. For example, athletics uh, or city uh, or in, uh, like combat sports, whatever. Um, and uh, you can also pick a specific city uh, on the side here so that if you want to meet people from uh, Berlin exclusively, then you only match with these people. So um, thanks, I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. And now Lucas is going to talk about the backend and front-end technologies. Uh, regarding, thank you, Benjamin. Regarding the tech stack, we used for the front-end React and Redux along with TypeScript. And on the back-end, we used Express with uh, Postgres SQLize. All right, and um, now regarding the insights, uh, well, I must say that a group project is totally different from a solo project for many, for many different aspects. But uh, one of the, the, the main one, the, the one that I can think of directly is that you need uh, good coordination and communication between the team. Because, for example, Lucas was working on this part of the code and was working on mine. And then uh, if you want to avoid uh, merge, con merge conflicts, you need to know exactly how you want to do things and predefine everything. This is why we spent two days um, drawing on the whiteboard basically to know how the app would be and one of the, the insights that I get from this uh, this whole experience is that maybe it's better to start by uh, designing uh, like creating a, a mock CSS HTML file and that so, so you know exactly what what things would look like uh, because for example we implemented this chat button but we placed it in uh, in a different in a different place and then it didn't work and then we had to think of another place where to put it and then it turned out that this was working good here like under the the profile the description but uh, in the end i think that having a good design is, is is a good basis and then add the different functionalities uh, would definitely be a, a good approach and this is also why we we spend a lot of time drawing things so um i hope uh, that uh, you enjoyed this video and um well, have a nice day and enjoy viewing the, the other projects. Thank you. So polite. That was <laughs> a very, very polite video. Um, and I know I've got to say, a lot of people get super nervous about filming themselves for these videos. And you guys were so chill. Like... You guys are not stressed at all. I've not seen such a chill video before. <laughs> um, Andrew, do you have anything to say? Hey, yeah, there's definitely room for another Tinder. There's a lot of lonely people in the world. Um, so like really good job, guys. I just want to ask two questions, really. One is to, I want to say Benjamin. And can you briefly talk about, because a lot of people here don't even know what Redux is or even state management. Because So can maybe you, you can touch on the benefits of it. Um, and then also for Lucas, can you talk about database planning? Because there's a lot that people don't see here. Uh, yes, yeah, so the advantage of uh, Redux is that uh, you have like this global state and you can access the elements from anywhere in the code. Uh, compared with React, it's a, it's a big advantage because you don't need to pass them like as, as props all the time. About the backend, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Andrew, Bernie, and Igor for helping him, me out. They've been instrumental, especially because uh, we had an idea to to make as little calls as possible to to the backend, and so we wanted to create a user a profile object that had all the nested received likes, given likes, and matches, and basically we sort of built a graph with SQLize and that was quite challenging. And I have to thank the TAs, they've, 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 been, they've been great. And uh, yeah, yeah. so that was quite a challenge. I would definitely consider a graph next time instead of SQLize, yeah. <laughs> um, Alessandro, do you have a question? Yep, um, yeah. so actually more, more than a question is uh, some feedback. Um, and uh, it's uh, just a, a few tips on little things that can be maybe improved in the presentation for the next time uh, and also for the juniors. And it's, it's a bit of a mix actually of uh, also a couple of pre presentations that uh, were before this one. So I, I thought of like grouping them together. Um, so 
someone mentioned before, like always guys, it's important you guys remember uh, to have energy in the, in the presentation. Uh, May, you said uh, it was uh, super chilled. I agree, it was very chilled and that was good. Uh, it's, it's maybe a little too chilled. <laughs> so maybe, yeah, uh, just, just remember to always uh, bring the energy and also think about the variations of like tone and voice as you're speaking. Because uh, if it's if it's constant uh, for the five minutes, uh, then it kind of people's attention kind of dies a little bit. Whereas if you have more variations of like being a little more quiet or having some silences sometimes, and then at some point like being very energetic, then you know people get like, "Ooh, what's going on? Like why things are changing?" Like it's 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 human mind. So it's something you can you can maybe use for future presentations. Um, another thing that I noticed in some previous presentations, like usage of password and emails and logging and registering users, try to minimize that. Uh, there was a, either either skip it entirely or just have autofill filling the fields and just and just uh, instead of typing it. Um, and um, there is uh, in in this presentation there was uh, I have I have an issue being a little picky. Uh, I wish there was a little more of Lucas. Uh, there was there was a bit a bit of an unbalance in, in terms of the the number of minutes. Um, I, I don't know if there was a specific reason for that, but uh, I, I would have loved to see also Lucas like uh, being more present uh, in in the presentation. Um, and and then uh, also when you show multiple client multiple things happening to clients like sending a message and receiving the message, uh, it's it's nice. Uh, to see the clients at the same time, kind of similar to what we saw for the bidding system, to have like two or three clients open on the screen. And so you can immediately see, instead of having to log out from one, log into the other. So these are things that I think can be useful for you guys for the next time you present, and also hopefully useful for the juniors, because uh, you're, you're going to you know, have to come up with, uh, with nice presentations in a few weeks. So. Uh, I wanted to just kind of group this feedback and and send it all. Do you, do you guys think it's it's useful? Is there anything that um, you want to comment upon these things? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with uh, the feedback. Um, yeah, but the, the issue was um, that I mean we we were trying to implement uh, one last thing and and then there was this bug and we tried to to solve the bug and we prefer to do that instead of uh, like making an amazing video. Uh, so in the end, uh, a good choice. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, all your, all your, uh, your feedback is totally justified. We, we made this video like as fast as we could. We were actually late, <laughs> but uh, it's, and, a, it's a good uh, video. It shows the app. Like I'm happy with it. It is true. Lucas should have talked a bit more, but uh, yeah, it's like we, we wanted to, I mean, we were in a rush basically, but yeah. you, yeah, I didn't want to bore the audience with my backend stuff I did, and I realized Benjamin had better presentation skills than I had, so I gave him the precedence, yeah. But cool, cool. But don't be timid. Um, you guys did a great job. You fixed the bug, which I guess, as a, as a developer, is the most important, important thing, and, and, you ship, and you ship the app, so congrats. Yeah, I think um, that's uh, one thing about developers that, that we've started to realize is just want to code always. And when you fix the bug, there's always another thing that you want to do. <laughs> and then uh, there's this video looming over your head. So um, anyways, is there any other questions? No? Can we give these guys one more round of applause before we move on? Cool. I also noticed that you guys uh, were matching in, in your video. I'm guessing that was, I'm going to say it was intentional. Anyways, okay, so moving on. Our next group is another remote group, CDT, and this is Investry. Okay. Hi, I'm Jack from Investry, the easy to use, lightweight investment portfolio tracker. We created Investory out of a frustration of using multiple overly complicated and cluttered tools. We wanted a simple way to track our current open positions without the need to log into different high security platforms. Investory has a simple UI where you can add and close your positions and keep track of different companies in real time with the markets, as well as interact with other users. I'll pass you over to Noemi who will take you through some of the features. Hi, and welcome to the demo. 
The first thing you're going to have to do in order to start tracking your personal investments is to land on the landing page. The landing page comes with night mode, so you can be financially responsible at any time of the day. Afterwards, you're going to have to sign up or log in. I decide to log in with my Google account. Once logged in, the summary page will be displayed. On the summary page, I will be able to see my current balance together with the daily change and the total change. I will be able to read some news and stay up to date with what's going on in the world. And I will see my positions. Apparently, I'm not doing that great. Therefore, I decide to speak to Asian and get some help. First things first, we're going to have to be courteous and have some small talk. After the small talk is done, we can go back to business and ask him for some uh, financial advice. Asian goes back to business and he brings me the information of three people that I can call. I decide to speak to Samantha and give her a call. After I've spoken to Samantha, it's time to make some change. So first of all, I just go and see what's the trend for Mastic Digital in stock. Since it is going down, I decide to close it. And once successfully closed, I will be able to see it in the closed tab. I also decide to delete one of these positions, that's just to save some more money. If I would like to add a new position, I just have to click on the add button and continue adding the position. I see that Tesla is doing pretty great, so I will just press on it and see what's going on with the stock in more detail. On the Tesla page, I can see the price and the volume in time. And I can also see how it's going on in candlestick format. I can zoom out and also zoom in. At the same time, I can also decide to download this data. Afterwards, I see that below there, it's, there's a discussion going on and I decide to take part of it. Once I've posted my comment, I'm just saying goodbye and logging out. Thank you so much. And now the tech stack. For our client, we are using React with Next.js, Apollo Client, Chakra UI, and GraphQL CodeGen. GraphQL CodeGen is a library that generates types and Apollo hooks based on our server GraphQL schema. We chose Chakra UI because it's a flexible component library that lets us use props to style our components, but it can also override styles from third-party components, which makes our team consistent throughout the app. For our database, we are using Postgres with TypeORM. We chose TypeORM because it's more TypeScript friendly with its decorator syntax. We are also using a third-party API called IEX Cloud to get the data on the financial instruments. For our server, we are using Apollo server. And we generate our GraphQL schema with a library called Type GraphQL. Type GraphQL uses the decorator syntax on our database models to automatically generate our GraphQL schema. This makes our models the only source of truth from server to client. We just create the models, type GraphQL generates our schema, and then on the client, GraphQL code gen generates Apollo hooks and TypeScript types from our schema. This results in a 100% type safety from server to client. Hello, so as we come towards the end of our presentation, let me share the insights with you. So what worked really well for us? Uh, I think choosing TypeScript was one of the very good decisions that we had made. Initially, we were a little bit hesitant, uh, but uh, eventually it helped us weed out a lot of bug at the very outset. We relied on code generation a lot. Almost 50% of our GraphQL client code was auto-generated. Using a component library like Chakra UI has helped us drastically reduce the styling time. Git workflow automation helped us work almost frictionlessly when it comes to code merging and collaboration. Above all, I cannot emphasize enough uh, the teamwork. Uh, we were all like-minded and we were all willing to experiment when it comes to using new technology and framework. We had very clear communication and agreed on workflow that uh, we have set up and everybody respected that. We have set up a very good peer approval process so that we each are familiar with others' code. We were all having different abilities, but in the end, we helped each other in achieving the overall goal. So what you would have done differently? Running the production build more often, uh, 
would definitely help us having a smooth deployment. Babel was a little bit of pain point that we could have explored uh, before using it in the project. And definitely we are going to use KE next time. Thank you. Guys, I don't think you could type this more if you tried. There was so much typing in there. Um, and GraphQL is like in, typed as well. Oh my goodness. Okay. There's a lot of typing. Um, Bernie. Um, Whoa, wait. feedback. Nice. Now you're muted. Wait, as Malian was saying, there's, there's a lot of typing in there. Um, so congrats, guys, because this is, looks amazing. Not only like the use of decorators on the back end, uh, tying everything together from back end to front end, bringing the types there and making sure that all the data is consistent and working together. Um, I know that you also had a lot of trouble with the database. So you did a lot of scrapping before and uh, managed to call the APIs just the necessary amount of times. Uh, so there was a lot going in. Not only that, but you did use a bunch of new technologies that we had never seen in the course uh, during the regular junior program. So can you, Tell me a little bit how you tackled that. How did you design to, to use all of these specific technologies and why you chose to do it? Oscar? Uh, so we, we chose to use a lot of different and new libraries, but uh, at the beginning, we wanted to make sure uh, to uh, try different and new things throughout the app. And as we continued to work on it, we uh, discovered new and fresh libraries, which in the end uh, helped us a lot during our development. Like it wasn't hustle to learn, learn it all, uh, especially in such a limited time, but in the long run, it was a investment that was essentially worth it uh, because we had a lot less bugs uh, and everything was smoother than it would have been otherwise. Yeah, I think uh, to, to add on that, I think we we definitely stumbled across a couple of libraries that like we didn't intend to ever like use them from the initial get go. Like Aaron Dam stumbled across like uh, type ORM, I think, uh, and then this code gen. And it was just like, OK, from just using GraphQL, we're now using these other libraries and they just saved us so much time in the long run. If we we hadn't have, like found those, it would have been. Uh, much more like writing code that was just unnecessary or duplicate like for, for all the typing. So that was a, a massive kind of time saver in the end. Nice. Um, Bernie, do you, is that a follow-up question you have? Uh, kind of. Well, I'm, I'm muted. Yeah. So sorry, we're having like feedback issues. Um, totally forgot what I wanted to say, so just go on to the next one. I'll, I'll come back to it. Oh, okay. Uh, Mandy. Hi, we have um, three questions. <laughs> First of all, how did you find like using Chakra UI? Were you all consistent? Did you use uh, separate CSS as well? Um, secondly, was the data all mock? And if you would not use mock data, where would you get your data from? And the third one is from Guy. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, about Git. Uh, can you expand a little bit uh, about your Git workflow and how you make it um, beneficial for your team? So uh, first of all, we uh, only use Chakra for styling. Uh, from the beginning, we decided that it will be the only styling option that we will use. And that helped us a lot in the wrong run. For example, we could implement dark mode just with a single line of code, just because we were using Chakra everywhere. Uh, and the second thing, the data that you've seen on the video is not mock. So we are using an API called IEX Cloud, but uh, we try to uh, scrape uh, the data that is not dynamic uh, from the beginning so that we don't spend our free limit because it's, it was a very limited API and it caused us a lot of problems uh, throughout the project. And for the third question, so from the, from the very beginning, uh, we created an extremely restrictive Git flow that didn't let us commit unless our types were correct, linting was correct, our formatting was correct, unless the app was building properly. And then you couldn't even push directly to branches. You needed to make a pull request and another team member had to approve it 
so it was all very restrictive and extremely annoying at first, but it paid off in the end because we didn't have uh, many errors uh, that blocked mm. us going forward. Yeah, uh, I just want to add to that, uh, that yesterday, basically, we had a refactoring time and we had almost uh, 35 items in the list. And because of this workflow, we could resolve all of them in just straight three hours. So that was really amazing. That's incredible. 35 issues in three hours? Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a question for Osgur. Did you use your solo project? Your, uh, what was it called? Osmet. No, we didn't. But now that you say it, I, I regret that I didn't. But no, we didn't. <laughs> oh, come on. Okay. He, he tried to push it on us, but that was our final straw. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Oscar. <laughs> um, Bernie, do you have your follow-up question now? Are you good? Yeah, I think I got it. So the other thing that I wanted to ask about was the chatbot that you guys implemented, because that's not fake. That is a real uh, chatbot working, and I wanted uh, to ask about it, and do you explain a little bit how it works? Yeah, I can jump in on here. Uh, the chatbot is not fake. It's actually using real data. It's, uh, it's using Dialogflow, which is made by Google. Um, a Dialogflow is actually an NLP, uh, which stands for Natural Language Processing Model. Um, and it's pretty easy to use. You only need to understand how an NLP model works and you need to feed in the data and then just add the responses to it. The only coding to say so that we use with the, with the bot was the integration itself. Everything else just came from the dialogue flow and anybody can create a bot with dialogue flow. Something. Nice. I just have one more question before we move on. Um, so you were talking about using as many types as possible and in the back end you wanted to use type ORM. Um, so actually, uh, I think it was Andrew who's been telling me a little bit about Dino and how it's all natively typed and it's like a new Node.js. Um, did you consider it? Was it an option? Uh, it wasn't an option, but I actually made my presentation on Dino. Like I, I would love to use it and push it more, but the libraries are very limited at the moment. If we if we had gone that path, we would probably be struggling uh, finding solutions for the simplest problems because there are not many libraries at the moment. Nice. No, I'm probably grateful because I don't think I would have been able to help with those help requests. Well, um, Andrew, I, I think you have something to say about Dino. Just for the record, it's got like full uh, SQL and Mongoose support now and GraphQL. Um, and all the lovely ORMs that go with it. So use Dino. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Next time. Okay, guys, one more round of applause and then we're moving on. Okay, so our next group is from London and this is Fairpoint News. Hi, my name is Johan and our app is called Fairpoint News. Fairpoint News is a news aggregator that allows you to read current news, but also track the political bias of the actual news you're reading. So why did we create Fairpoint? I often find myself arguing that people should read news from a range of sources to get a range of political views and angles. But I realised how hard it was to adhere to my own advice. There was no easy way for Britons to actually make sure that their newsfeed was objective. Fairpoint does just this. It's a web app that provides you with every side of the story. It aggregates online media to keep you updated with the latest news categorized by the UK political spectrum. Our vision is to empower the informed reader by allowing our readers to track their news intake. The app even changes colour based on your political stance and what news you read. Really? Yes, and it also creates a deep copy of your soul and saves it to MongoDB. What? So we have a slick user interface. Um, just visit the home page and you get a list of the latest news, uh, all aggregated by tons of online media. If you click on the story, you will uh, just see what articles are actually covering that specific story, uh, and they're all categorized by political stance. If you click an article, Fairpoint will store it, helping you keep track of your news habits. Visit the analytics page to track your political bias Explore keywords you're exposed to and view your most read news sources. 
Okay guys, I'm just going to show um, some of the additional features of um, Fairpoint News. Uh, so it's a uh, PWA, um, this is Create React App, so I'm just going to uh, click on the uh, downloaded uh, icon here. And here we go, we load into Fairpoint News. Um, here is uh, here is all the current news. Um, we've got sort of placeholders for uh, as it's loading uh, the actual uh, business news there. Um, so we have um, login via Google Auth. So I'll just click the sign in button. Um, I've already created an account, uh, account with Google, so it'll just instantly sign me in. And you'll see that the um, the background has, has changed. That's our color changer. Um, so uh, as I want to show you my profile um, so this is what my profile settings look like at the moment um, I can deselect um, the different tabs that I, I don't want to see or want to see and if I go back to the home you'll see that the um, the tabs have disappeared um, and I can re-add them uh so if I click on a story say this one about Facebook I'll, you'll see all these different articles uh, separated out into their into their political leanings and say I, I'm able to share a story, say this one by The Guardian, on my Facebook, Twitter, or I can just simply copy the link to my clipboard. Uh, and if I click on the article, it will open up the uh, article on The Guardian. To make this happen, we use Node Express as our backend server and using MongoDB with Mongoose to store our information. To aggregate our news stories, we used Puppeteer and Cheerios to scrape Google News. For the front end, we created a React server using Material UI's beautiful and easy to use components to get a slick modern feel to the user interface. We deployed our app on Heroku. You can visit it on fairpointnews.com. As we bought our premium domain name for £72,000, consider donating a pound on our donation page. Hmm, learnings. Strategy, strategy, strategy. Um, I would plan at least two days what you want to build before even starting writing any code. Uh, so we used a lot of material UI components for the front end, which took a couple of days to, to learn how to use and configure, but once I did learn how to use it, uh, it looked great on our website and also sped up the building process for the front end in the long term. So uh, key takeaways, uh, probably that um, continuous integration and deployment on Heroku uh, was absolutely sort of amazing for us. Um, it, it meant that when we went home, we could play around with the app as real life users, and we could develop um, sort of new ideas and also pick up on all the bugs um, that we might not have got uh, to before uh, deploying. So yeah. It would be better to consider more carefully about managing state in React app. So maybe consider use Redux in order to manage state more efficiently. Uh, we just want to say a massive thank you um, to all of our colleagues here in London and all over the world. A uh, huge uh, thank you to Andre, uh, Malin, Vic, Leo, Mo, uh, everyone else at Codeworks, our friends and family, and Berta, uh, and Berta, and Berta, and Berta, and Berta, and Berta, and Berta, and Berta. Cool. <laughs> I am um, okay. I take it back. Barcelona, maybe London also has an advertising <laughs> sprint as well. <laughs> um, it looks like a documentary, <laughs> especially with the outfits. Um, except you, Johan, where was your tie? Come on, I know, um, I know. I wasn't looped into the choreographed clothing, so I'm ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, that's so mean. Oh, dear. Okay, um, Andre, what do you have to say? Great work, you guys. This was absolutely amazing effort. Um, I only wish that you talked a little bit more about how you got your data because it's a really cool algorithm that you built in the back end. So Ollie, if you want to elaborate a little bit more, you know, sell it out so you can earn those donations. But overall, great work, you guys. I'm really proud of it. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, so yeah, so what we're doing is we're scraping the uh, Google RSS feed. Um, uh, you have to sort of access it um, using a NPM package. And then off the back of that, we then go into each story and then we're using um, Puppeteer and Cheerio to uh, dig into that story and scrape the whole of 
each of those web pages. So we're looking at, I think we scrape about 400 different pages and we're doing uh, some of that every eight minutes and then throughout an hour. So every hour the news is being updated live. Um, so we'd like to make it faster, but we didn't want to um, piss off Google and get us banned. <laughs> Basically. Yes. Nice. Um, Mandy, I think you have a question. Hey guys, it looked really cool. I was just wondering in your app you show subscribe to newsletter, is that actually implemented? And if so, what did you use? Uh, that's our, that's the we one. saw that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, upcoming, watch the space. <laughs> well done, man. You chose the one thing that they hadn't actually done yet. Come on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just interested in how it was done. <laughs> Belgium, Belgium API, that's all I can say, top secret. <laughs> um, Alejandro, um, I think you had a question up for ages, sorry. Uh, yeah, guys, well done, that, that's an amazing app. I really like it. Um, I was just really curious about how you guys were evaluating how, how a, a piece of news was more right wing or left wing. Um, and also um, that the thing about the colors is really nice that it kind of gives you a feedback of where you're kind of leading. Uh, but I mean, like um, in the US, like let's say red is kind of more right wing and in Italy, red would be kind of more communist. So it's really the opposite, uh, but that would probably need to be adapted like for cultural bias, let's say. I'll take, I'll take the first question. So, um, what we've, what we've got is a, is, a, is a very big file that's basically we link each of the newspapers um, to a, a rating that we get them based on some research that we've done on the website. Um, in, we want to build that out and also take into account like uh, customers' viewpoints as well. I think it's really important. Um, at the moment, it's very UK centric. So these are the UK newspapers. We obviously get news from all over the world, um, but that's our focus. Um, maybe eventually we'll attach. Who knows? Um, do you want to? Oh, the, oh, the, the color, the color change. Uh, the color change, how it worked. Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, so just um, so in the UK, it's it, red, yeah. red is left. We can hard blue is that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we but can for sort. example, in Hong Kong, right would be blue, left would be yellow. Uh, but that would that quite easily could be hard uh, coded in. Uh, just, just two colours and a third colour in the middle if you choose to have one. Yeah. But at the moment, London centric. Um, UK centric. centric, centric, centric. So, yeah, keep us in. But no. <laughs> you can't. We're catching all of our bugs. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, let's move um, on. Alex, you have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's um, more than a question and encouragement. I, I think the project is brilliant. I think you guys uh, did an awesome, you, you picked up a very interesting topic. Maybe it's also a topic that I personally find um, particularly interesting. I, I've, I've had debates in the, in, the, in the past about this with friends. I know it's, it's, a, it's a problem um, in, the, in the tech sector is one of the things that um, it's trying to be, there are several ways that are trying to address this issue and uh, we haven't really found a good system yet, but the um, space, uh, is super interesting, right? Because it's super relevant. Uh, it, there is a there is a lot of big entities out there that would love to have a good solution for this problem. Uh, of course, this is a, this is a, a little stab at it uh, because it's a huge problem, right? Uh, it's to do with um, uh, authenticity of news and uh, and and then tra transparency and 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 political bias and AI and so on and so forth. Um, so basically, my word of encouragement is um, if you if you guys enjoyed doing this, um, it'd be lovely if you end up releasing something in the space. And if you're interested to keep working on it, I think there is a lot that can be done. Uh, maybe maybe you're even going to find a company. I, I don't know what your personal plans are for each one of you. If you're thinking of join some team and, and work with some teams, there's a possibility you can find something to do in this space exactly. But, Brilliant app, beautiful project. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you, so, thank you very really much. Really appreciate that. Um, and it is live, it, you can navigate to it. Um, so. Oh, nice. Can you post? Um, is it already in the? Oh, there it is. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I just also want to say, because obviously I see these guys every day working, um, while they all specialized in one area, the teamwork of these guys is incredible. Like, um, and there's Johan as well. I know we can see all three of those guys together, but Johan was there. Um, and honestly, that's the reason they didn't have hardly any help requests um, because they just work together so well, so, so well. Um, so before we move on, I would just want to say, Oli, like, I don't think you really grasped on how amazing this web scraper is that you did. Um, like, holy crap. Can I just say, I looked at this function. He was like, can I just show you something? We've implemented in London a brag request for things such as this. I looked at this function and it was, I don't know how, know how many lines long, super long. Um, and I don't know, I just think it's absolutely incredible. I'm gobsmacked by you guys. So can we have one more final round of applause before we move on? Okay, so this is the last video, guys. Um, and this is Minions of Disruption from Berlin. Hi, we are Joachim, Ina, Philipp and Toby. Our former classmate Lisanne put us in touch with a Dutch NGO called Day of Adaptation. And the NGO has a board game that we adapted to the web which is called Minions of Disruption. So here we go. So let's go and uh, create our first game so we can invite some people. We can load a game or create a game. Let's create one. We choose English and let's say two rooms. Um, we have two rooms now where we can invite people. On top we have this code 2547 that we send to all our friends that we want to play with. And there we have some already, like they're super excited to start the game, as you can see. We adjust the interval for the emissions. So, um, and uh, let's start the game, have fun. The game starts with the tutorial and every player has to press next for the next uh, step of the tutorial to appear. This is a cooperative game about climate change. And because with the real issue, you really have to work together with other people. We thought it is important to emphasize this in the game. In our game, we have not only cooperative actions, which you can see now, we can move someone else to another spot in a special card. But we also have things that are global effects that not only affect our board, but also the board of other players that play at the same time. So now we can see that when this card hits us, it not only has a negative effect on us, but also on the board where Phil, Andrew and Bernie are playing. Fighting climate change is not only about how little we pollute, it is also about how much resilience we build in our community. In this game we have certain cards that lets you place a cillion on a part uh, of the map, which in turn lets you fight the uh, climate change more efficient afterwards. In addition to that, every player has a unique role. All the roles represent real-life community heroes that have special powers. If used efficiently, these special powers can be uh, beneficial for the teamwork in order to fight climate change more efficiently. A unique feature of the original board game was that you play on one board with four or three players, but also with other people on other boards, so you can change things there. We implemented this in our version too, so as you can see here, um, some special cards give you, the, um, give you the power to change players on other boards or to collaborate together to fight climate change. All this has to happen very quickly because, as you can see on the top left, the emissions rise on all boards at the same time in certain intervals. One of the ways to cooperate with other tables in the game is through special cards. Here you can see one of those cards in action. And in order for both tables to benefit, they have to negotiate first. And then um, you collect three zillions on one shield and you can see the icon of the, the shield on the bottom right corner of the game. Once you collect five of uh, those, the game will end once the game host calls time out. For the front end of our project we use TypeScript and React. 
TypeScript we would recommend to anyone to do. It's saved us so many bucks and it's just great for collaborating with other people because the code is very re readable quickly. Uh, in this project, React, uh, we kind of hit the limits of that because we had a few timing issues. The um, synchronous exchange of data between the admin players of one board and the different boards we managed with uh, Socket.io and uh, used MongoDB to save uh, the boards and uh, admin data and uh, everything is deployed by Heroku. In such a challenging project and a time limit of two weeks, it's extremely important to have clearly defined roles and a good communication between team members. If we were to do the project again, we would maybe structure it in a way so that um, all the logic happens in the back end and there is a single source of truth which informs all the players of the game state. I would like to add that you should be prepared that certain tasks would take a lot more time than you expect them to. And here are some words from Shu Liang, uh, the chair of Day of Adaptation. Our goal is to empower people and organizations to adapt to climate change. Going from this to online is a huge step forward. Thank you, Joaquin, Tobias, Ina and Philip for your hard work. We're excited to see the possibility of inviting more participants from around the world in adapting to climate change together. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, it just looks complicated just from watching. Like, I cannot imagine trying to create that. Um, also, I have to say, you guys look like a band <laughs> when you stood there together. Um, it was very cool. <laughs> um, Andrew, what do you have to say? Yeah, so I do definitely have some questions for these guys. But first, I just wanted to uh, just say that I'm in awe and how much work that was produced in the last two weeks. I did a code review and there was 254 pages, files of code. And no, that didn't include no modules. Um, so like ridiculous, took me all day. Um, also, I walked into work this morning at 8 a.m. and I saw Joachim walking the other direction to go home because he was in work all night. This isn't the first time this has happened. Uh, so the dedication is outrageous. Um, so I have four questions. Um, one to Ina, SCSS over CSS and grid to style instead of position absolute. Um, Tobias, um, use reducer slash context API and TypeScript. Um, and then Philip, um, soccer IO, but not just the normal soccer IO, but namespaces, because you had multiple boards. And then lastly, Joachim, um, can you tell me the importance of project management and being an AKA Git fluffer? Um, so I have never used grid before this project and uh, because there are so many elements on the map, um, I had to learn and it was very useful for this particular task. I also find it um, very logical and I prefer to Flexbox. Uh, also, after a while, I had to, we started using just CSS, <clears throat> but after a while, when there was so much code, we had to refactor to SAS and I would totally recommend it, especially if the project is really big. I just, I just would like to add that just for you to comprehend what it means to use grid, like every single little element is placed on a grid. So you have like, I don't know, 30 lines here, 30 lines there, and everything or more even. <laughs> it's insanity. So it, yeah, just to, to highlight Ina's in, insane work there. Philip, right there. Yeah, um, about Socket.io. Um, it has quite a good documentation. So at the beginning, it was really a joy to work with it. And we have been surprised how well it works. But um, yeah, it has some weird behavior sometimes. So if we wanted to control, for example, what the admin can hear, what the admin can see uh, and control, but um, people in the other board shouldn't see, uh, it was not always easy to figure that out. We worked with the namespaces. So the admin is in one place and 
all the players are in another namespace and in separate rooms, so they can communicate between each other by the special cards. So uh, it works, but it uh, was not that easy. But definitely, I think Socket.io is is well written and has a good documentation. Yeah. Um, so to the use reducer. Um, so um, working with React has certain advantages and I think sh certain shortcomings. When we started using the reducer, the use reducer, um, instead of like, I guess, 30 use states, um, it made life a lot easier in, in managing them. Um, and context, we looked into it, if it would help us. In this case, it wouldn't help us so much. So we decided against it and also decided against using some, something like uh, Redux because in my opinion, a use reducer and a use context has everything that I need uh, if I, I mean, up to now. So I'm really happy with that. Also TypeScript, I cannot comprehend how you do anything that uh, <laughs> goes into this kind of level of complexity without TypeScript. It's like, it's, it's, it's not comprehensible for me. So TypeScript all the way has all my love. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, project management wise, um, I don't know um, what to say after the first week um, because going into the project, it um, it started pretty well, and then um, as soon as we had all the basic uh, basic pieces in place and the and the and the basic logic in place, um, the complexity just started to to ramp up quite a bit because when we add all the different roles and we have um, cards that play across different boards and we have the front end so collabor uh, so connected to the back end with um, socket calls going back and forth and having a million states on the front end, uh, it just became a, a bit um, <laughs> hard to plan every feature out, um, I would say. But having, um, I personally was a little bit, uh, uh, I would not say disappointed, but uh, I didn't feel I contributed so much in the beginning because I spent so much time just keeping our states uh, on GitHub together so that we would actually work on the same uh, Code branch ish, um, yep. So uh, I think it can help a lot of projects to have one that kind of keeps all um, all the branches in check and and make sure that people are working on uh, on on the same source basically. Uh, and I also like to add that basically we were, uh, Joachim and, and me, we started out uh, pair programming, the, the core logic of the game, because it's very complex to understand the game in itself at first, and then also to make the computer understand the game. It's a whole different game. Um, so we pair programmed a lot, which uh, was very helpful. I would recommend that uh, in, in a case where it makes sense. And then he went also into uh, Philip's world, dealing with the sockets on the back end, and then came back, which helped to link these two parts together and, and bring it like to one. So yeah, amazing. Thank you, guys. Nice. It sounds like you guys have really nice teamwork. Um, Osgar, you have a question? Yeah, first of all, amazing job, guys. It looks amazing. But I wanted to ask where you got the assets from, because they're all really good. Um, yeah, since this is already a board game um, in real life, uh, in physical form, as, uh, as uh, our client Shu um, just showed also in the video, um, we had a lot of the, I mean, we got all the assets from, from, um, from the organization. Um, there was a little bit back and forth. We had to get another format in, uh, in many of the files, but, uh, but we didn't, uh, yeah, most of it we didn't sign. Yeah, the cloud, the cloud is Ina all the way. <laughs> and, so, and sound effects also uh, to be did himself. So uh, that is made up. Nice. Um, guys, honestly, it's gobsmacking. I, I'm really curious. Did you know the game before you created it? Um, we decided <laughs> to do the project together on a Thursday. And on Friday, we played it together with uh, Shu online in a, a simplified version to understand it. And then we yeah, have planned for another day or two before we started writing code. Right. So you wrote the code in 10 days. 
I mean, I guess it, it, it was, <coughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> ten, ten, 10 days and 10 nights. <laughs> yeah, 12, 24 hour days. Um, incredible. Uh, does anybody have, else have anything to say before we wrap it up? Okay, nice. Let's just give these guys one more round of applause. Right, so I did actually mention it right at the beginning that these guys only had 14 days with planning, with project management, with everything on top, sometimes talking to clients, sometimes overcoming tech issues. Um, and yes, that's like everyone can understand it's not a long time, but now that you've seen what people have created, after, after not very long of learning how to code, we're only six weeks in, not even six weeks, sorry, five weeks into the program, um, everyone should be absolutely so proud of themselves. Um, all the TAs, like I know, well, I don't know from our end, my end, I'm so proud. It's incredible. Like you guys have blown it out of the park. It's incredible. Um, so yeah, I guess that's about it. Um, yeah, there's there's one thing I also wanted, wanted to say. Uh, we, this group, I remember when you guys also did the demos for, well, I mean this cohort, like the entire cohort, uh, when you guys did the demos for the solo projects, uh, it was one of the most outstanding demos uh, we have seen in years. Uh, so that's, that's you know, something for the whole cohort uh, that I think it's something nice to celebrate as we're all together uh, today. And I have to say that I've seen some pretty exciting projects for the thesis as well. Uh, and it's, it, it's not easy, it's not given that because you do a great solo project, then you also uh, still have energy and commitment to do a, a really, really good thesis project. So uh, I think, I think for, for many of you, uh, it's, it's been an incredible journey. At least seeing it also from, from our side, it's wow. Okay, so the things you've, you've built are, are there to, to prove what you're able to do. And what Maylin keeps saying, and it's so, so relevant, is just in this amount of time, like what can you achieve if we give you more time, right? So it's, 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 it's incredible. Uh, one of the things that I think is going to be useful also for the juniors and something that I want to take a chance to mention uh, is teamwork. Uh, some, some groups had exceptional teamwork, and I think the result um, is also a reflection of that. Uh, and some groups had challenges with teamwork. Uh, there, there's been some groups that have had some challenges, and uh, we're here to learn, so I don't think that one is good and the other is bad. Of course, having great teamwork is desirable, but I think also the groups that had challenges with teamwork, I think they had a chance to learn um, how to make it better, uh, how to address issues, how to talk uh, with, with your, uh, you know, the, the people that you, you're working with. Uh, and if something is not going as you wish, how to communicate it or how to handle it. Uh, and and be proactive about it, right? Don't don't wait until the last the last day or or the second last day before you're going to deliver something. Imagine when you guys are going to be working in a, in a team in a company, and you have a deadline. That's usually you know deadlines are are, are longer at, at at a workspace. It can be a project can be like a month, two months. Generally, it's not going to be like a one week or two weeks. But um, uh, you know, uh, don't don't wait the last few days to address them. And I hope that everyone. Um, you know, learned from this from these two weeks uh, about like how it's different to work in a team with four, five, three people than you know working on your solo project. Uh, and so, yeah, it's an encouragement also for uh, the future juniors to really dig into the, the teamwork and how sometimes a technical result does not only come from technical skills. Uh, so, congrats for all the amazing work you've done. Okay, guys, so um, I think that about wraps it up. If no one else has anything to say, um, I guess we all say an amazing congratulations to everybody. And again, happy birthday to Igor and Baiju. Let's not forget it's their birthday.
And an applause for our host, for, for Maylin as well, I think, from everyone. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> the queen of our streams. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, I guess that's it, everybody. Like, amazing work. Well done, seniors. Um, that was, I think, the longest days are over now for the boot camp, anyway. <laughs> Get some sleep. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.